Come on, let's give it up for the Lord today, guys. Let's give it up for the Lord today. Come on, man, put your hands together. Let's do it. Praise the Lord today. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Be seated. Wow. Love that, man. What a great time of worship. Chris, I got to be careful, man. I'm down there singing my lungs out, and then I got to get up and speak. So it's a good thing. So I just wanted to tell you today, what a great thing to praise the Lord together. It's just wonderful to be together, be with you, have this fellowship. And uh, I just appreciate you so very much, very much. Let's pray together just for a minute. Father, in these next few minutes, I believe, and we believe, that you're going to speak to every one of us. Lord, sometimes we use the word, someone needs it real bad. But Lord, all of us need it real bad. Every one of us, we have our own personalities and dispositions. We're all doing different things. We're all at different stages of life. That's the beauty of your design for the church, that we would come together. And Lord, even here at Genesis, we've got people from every walk of life. That's the greatest thing about the church. Lord, we thank you even here that we can be the church where everyone can invite anyone. Sometimes, Lord, we wonder about that anyone, and that means anyone, because all people are welcome in this place, because this place is about Jesus. That's it. So thank you for this moment in time. And we bless your name together. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. I love um, being around people that just impact my life. I'm going to tell you a lot about that today. And we've been introducing the subject of a powerful testimony. God will use you. So I want to begin here with our map that we've been using uh, for quite some time now. Had someone today come up to me and say, you know, I just, uh, I'm enjoying uh, actually seeing what we're reading, even in a graphic form. And I've tried to stick with this map. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I've got a lot of pictures I'd like to show you. But I, I looked at this, I said, man, do I need to get up here and keep showing you pictures of these places? A lot of these places I've been to myself, you know, I don't want to do, I want you to get it. Because we're talking about Paul that we all know about, probably the most well-known of the Bible characters, Paul the Apostle. Everybody knows about Paul. Most people, I mean, you have to be a rank pagan to have never heard about Paul. You just got to be really somewhere out there in the wild blue yonder, if you understand. Most people know about Paul, and he was an incredible person. You know, he died a few years ago, but I, I can imagine that he was, he was no different to us. He was a person just like us, just lived centuries ago and dressed probably differently and they didn't have what we have and we all get that. But God spoke to this man, Paul, after he gave his life to Christ and said, I'm going to use your witness and your testimony to be a change maker, to be a difference maker. So where we're at right now is we're getting toward the end of his life. That's a fair statement. We're not there yet. But when he went out, this map here represents the known world to them in Paul's time. You say, well, where's the United States? 
I, I hate to tell you this, but we were not in the known world at this time. This is a little before Christopher Columbus and the boys. All right? This was the known world. So you, when you look at this, I want you to look at this like we look at our globe today. I mean, this is the whole world. This is what they understood. And God sent him out. This was the third time God sent him out. The third world journey that Paul went on. And we've been following it, and we know that he ended up here in Ephesus. And when he was in this town here in Ephesus, God did some amazing things in Ephesus. And it was at the end of his ministry there, he was there for about two years, God made something very clear to him, said to him, Paul, now I want you to go back to Jerusalem. And Paul knew that going back to Jerusalem probably would mean that he'd get killed. You know, that's where they killed Jesus. And he was serving Jesus. In fact, we're going to read about it again. He told them, he said, I serve Jesus. They now God's telling him, why don't you go back to where Jesus was killed on a cross? He was crucified. And Paul knew that as far as he could figure out in his own heart that when he went back to Jerusalem, he was going to face some pretty tough times. And he'd already been through a lot of tough things. I mean, he'd done a lot of things. And he'd been hounded out of towns and cities and stoned and persecuted. He'd been put in prison. But he knew that when he went back here, it was a death sentence. And he said, I'll go. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain, I'll go. So before he came back here, he took one more trip around in Greece, Macedonia, this area here just to go and visit his friends and to strengthen the church and encourage everybody. And he came back here going through all of these islands, and instead of going to Ephesus, he lands here at this place called Miletus. Miletus. Miletus, by the way, just a few little interesting things for those of you that are interested in these things. Miletus, back in Paul's day, was a, was a pretty significant place. Just to give you an idea, Miletus is almost exactly 36 miles from the town or the city of Ephesus. So the distance from there to there, you're looking at about 36 miles. It's actually important. It's relevant. Tell you a couple of things about Miletus. Can you see this? I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but there's a river that goes down like this. I'm going to follow it again. There goes this river, winning its way down there. Got a coolest name for a river ever. It's called the Meander River. Meander. It's like they were original. That's what rivers do. They meander down to the sea. And the Meander River came out right here at Miletus. So what did they have there? They had a port. It was a place of entry. Not unlike Ephesus, 36 miles away. Problem with the Meander River, it carried a lot of silt. It was a very um, churning river. The waters churned a lot, carried a lot of silt. Very soon after the time of Paul, they couldn't keep up with it because... They didn't have dredging and boats and shovels like we do today. And it began to clog up. So when you go to Miletus today, the port is hardly recognizable. It's been obliterated because the land has built up over the centuries. The thing about Miletus here it was a Greek city. Here's another great thing that you may be interested in. It was really known for its literary, academic value. Some of you may remember here in Ephesus, they had a fantastic library built, seat of learning, and the big school of medicine was in Ephesus. All the, a lot of the academic big guns 
came to live in Miletus. That's just what they did. One of those people, you may or may not recognize his name, his name was Thale, T-H-A-L-E. And if you've studied these guys like I've done over the years, you'll remember what Thale was known for. Thale is hailed and is known as the first man ever to recognize the possibility of a solar eclipse. And just think about that. I don't want to say too much about it. We live today, we say, oh, get a life, you know, solar eclipse. We understand it, we see it. But back then, that was quite some genius. They didn't have telescopes. <clears throat> Astrology was not at the level, of, not even close. Astronomy, we could go on and on. The science of the stars <clears throat> was limited essentially to human genius, and it was a concept. So Thale became known as the man who first began to talk about this strange phenomenon called a solar eclipse. So if you're ever at school and you're doing a test, remember that. They'll think you're a genius because you know exactly where it all stands. It's called what? Miletus. Miletus. It all came out of there. By the way, a lot of our heritage is owed to the Greek mind. The Greeks. Cicero. I better stop right here. Okay. So, this is a significant place. And when he gets there, he knows he's about to get on the boat and head on down here, and in all likelihood he's going to be killed. And so he calls all the leaders of the church, the spiritual leaders from Ephesus, and he says, put on your Nikes, get on your camels and your donkeys, and take 36-mile journey, which was like three days, and come to Miletus. I need to tell you something. Here it is. So let's read it again. I'm going to be in Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. Now from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus, called the elders of the church to come to him. When they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know that I've lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia that I've served the Lord with all humility and tears. And despite the trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I've often said to myself, I've just got to add this in here. <laughs> well, let me put it this on you. If you knew that you were about to die, how many people around you would be able to verify the life you've lived for Christ? How many? I've just asked that question myself. Have you noticed something about funerals? It's not the best subject to talk about sometimes. But I've, I've been at hundreds of funerals. Have you noticed how all of a sudden most other things don't matter anymore? The business you built, the house you lived in, they're not irrelevant. The number of ball games you went to, clubs you belonged to. I, I think somehow that Paul knew this. He, he understood this. He got it. 
So he called this group of people. And what he said to them has within its fabric the keys to Paul's powerful testimony. I've given you the first three, but I want to just remind you. Number one, his testimony was an affirmation, was seen in the affirmation of leaders. And, and if you weren't here last week, I, I spoke about how incredible it is that God not only appoints leaders, has leaders around all of us, but about the significance of the affirmation of leaders who know. But then I took that and I put it into families. I remember about five or six weeks ago, I was talking to a friend of mine, actually, from out of state. And his father had died. And he loved his father. But he made a statement to me. He said to me, you know, Don, I never heard my daddy tell me that he loved me. So I'm just saying to you, moms and dads, you are that leader in Ephesus to your children in mightily. You are. So this weekend, have you told your son, your daughter that you love them? Have you affirmed them? Because you know have you ever met someone who says, man, don't affirm people in ministry. Don't affirm. Don't buy into that. That's a lie of the devil. Affirm your life group teacher. Affirm the people who sing. Affirm the people who prepare the table. Affirm your parents. Parents, affirm your sons and daughters. Say something. Say it. Are you listening? Paul called the leaders and said, I know that you know. He tapped into their affirmation. But he went, he went beyond that. He said, he was also, he told them that he was faithful over time. He said, I've done this all my life. Woo! That's a tough one. There's something very incredible about a lady who has just lived a life well-pleasing to the Lord ever since Jesus came into her heart. Now you think about Paul. What was he talking about his life? Because Paul was an adult when Jesus came into his heart. He wasn't talking about before he met Jesus. He was talking about after he met Jesus. That's a life. It's a powerful testimony. But the third thing he was saying, the key, third key to his testimony was that he was focused on serving Jesus. You know, I love that, that little statement that he says there in verse 19. He says, listen... I've done this the whole time. Verse 19, serving Jesus. That's it. That means that everything else falls into place under serving Jesus. <laughs> That's really something. I... Now, you might look at me and say, well, you know, you're the preacher, <laughs> so it's easy for you. I, I understand that. I get that. I, I promise you, I understand that. This is what I do. But would you, uh, maybe you won't, that's fine with me, but I'm also going to tell you that I'm also just a normal person. I know this may come as a shock to at least one person here. And if you know me well, like a lot of you do, 
I, I love it all. I enjoy life, man. My kids, I love being on vacation. Love going to the beach. Love traveling. Love eating and going out. I love trying to work out. I love being around friends. I love having fun nonstop. I, I, I really enjoy life. And I have to constantly say to myself, serve Jesus. He comes at the top. Seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness and then all the other things will be added to you. Can you feel the kind of discipline of that? So what, what is clouding, what, what occupies your attention? Answer this question. What exactly did you do yesterday? You probably did the same as me in different ways and at different age groups. I got into ball games yesterday. I was with family yesterday. I ate some good food yesterday. I tried to work out yesterday. I, you know, you name it, everything, all in one day. But I've got a concept. Paul's testimony was about serving Jesus. Number four, his testimony spoke about how humble he was in spirit. Now look at that. This, this is an amazing thing here, guys. Look at verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility. I guess for the rest of my life, I'll talk about Dr. Billy Graham. I'll never stop talking about him, so just... And because for over two decades, I had the joy and honor of sitting at his feet, literally. And as his personal pastor and friend, eight out of ten times, it was me and he, privately. I ate with him, walked with him, prepared sermons with him. Encouraged him, held his hand when he got sick, went to the hospital, took him to the hospital. If you don't fully understand this man, Dr. Billy Graham, known all over the world, the people we deal with dealt with with Mr. Graham were the, you name to me, the top most famous people you know in the world. And I, prob, I probably will say to you, every one of them has come and met with Dr. Billy Graham. They come to him, by the way. Did you know presidents of the United States of America came to Mr. Graham? They would send planes to get him. This is like high cotton here, in my opinion. All right? You may not feel that way. So, and not only that, the last 10 years of his life, he was a member of our church. Is that not cool? He's a member of our church. One of our church members. So now I'm going to tell you something. I will never be able to quite get it that this man who was so famous that was sought after by the most famous rock stars, athletes, Muhammad Ali, came to his house to see him. You name baseball, the top baseball football players in the world, top football players. I had some of the highest, most top football players in the world call me to ask me if I could try and make it possible for them to come and visit Mr. Graham. 
and me just getting a call from one of these people, like I'm dropping the phone here, until I realized it had nothing to do with me. And every one of these famous people that called, I wanted to know if they'd like my autograph before they left. Right, yeah, right. It's like, who is this nobody? Let me tell you something about Mr. Graham. You cannot describe a man so great and yet so humble with everybody. Everybody. You can read it. You can see it. You can talk about it. I was there. I'm telling you. Can't describe it. God gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And that's what Paul was saying. And you know, if you, if you talk about humility in the adjectival sense, in the adjectival sense, if you're describing the quality of humility in a person's life, a humble person is someone who respects others. So you are not humble if you are strutting around the world, getting in everybody else's face, telling them how low they are. That's not humility. That doesn't attract, it repels. It pushes people away. They don't want to be around you. Humility is respectful. It's submission. It, it, it carries with it an unassertiveness. And if you put it in its verbal sense, if you're trying to make it into an action or a doing word, a humble person is a person who considers themselves lower than everybody and anybody else. You are never more important than anybody. Period. Now, hold on. You cannot tell me, well, you are the president of this or the prime minister of that, or you own this company, or you're the one that makes it. Humility, in a classic sense, means that your attitudinal disposition is that you actually consider yourself lower than everybody else. Wow. Boy, that's a tough one. Anyone find that easy to do? You want a piece of me? That's the natural disposition. That's my disposition. It's everybody's disposition. See, this is a spiritual thing, isn't it? It's something that we strive for. It's what the Spirit of God does in us. But he didn't just stop there with humility. He went to the next key of his personal testimony, compassion. He uses the word tears. He, he, said, he was compassionate in his heart. Tears. He said, I, I want you to know that you leaders know that I've done this all my life. That I've, I've, I've served Jesus. What a testimony. And then I've tried to do it in humility, considering myself lower than anybody else, less than anybody else. And I'm doing it with compassion, tears. So what, is, what does that mean? If you, if you try and unpack it, if, if you're a person, what Paul was saying is he's saying, you know that I have tried my level best under the Spirit of God to be sympathetic to the point at which my sympathetic concern for the suffering and misfortune of others is paramount. You know, we use that phrase sometimes, man, I'm hurting with you. That, that's what this is. 
Your pain is my pain. You know what? You'll never respond to people in the Bahamas who have gone through terrible suffering in a hurricane if you don't respond with compassion. You'll never welcome anybody else to church if you don't welcome them with compassion. You won't be a difference maker. That's why I, I often use this if you're in a school lunchroom. Guys, I, I, I know you do this. I'm just telling you what you do, and I admire you for that, young people. You go into school, any school gathering, just say, Lord, from now on, from Monday Every time I'm in my circle, I'm going to open my eyes and I'm going to look for somebody standing there by themselves. And then I'm going to leave my circle and I'm going to go and stand with them. <laughs> and then I'm going to say, why don't you come and join us? That's compassion. Because what are you doing? You are Walking in someone else's shoes. In every lunchroom, I will guarantee you, there's at least one young man or young lady that's eating by themselves. Do you know how many go to school every week, come home, and nobody wants to talk to them? When you walk into school in the mornings, just look out. You'll see, you'll see them. They'll be there backpacked. They'll be slouched walking along the wall. Or they'll come from a distance over there. And all the in-group, it's nothing wrong with the in-group. All the friends are standing. And they'll come in and kind of nod. Just nod. If they do that, they're even afraid to look up. You know why they're afraid to look up? Someone's going to mock them. Someone's going to say, oh, well, look who's coming here. Someone's going to bully them. Can you feel this? So where do you come in? Where do we come in, guys? Not just young people. Where do we fit? This is what Paul was actually saying. This is the power testimony that we're talking about. Man, it just gets all over me. <laughs> Because I find myself too often really majorly concerned in my own plate of food. One of the sweetest things you can do in a restaurant, I don't do it nearly enough. I'll tell you some of the sweetest times I've ever had getting a meal is when God just got mine. I've looked up and I see an elderly lady sitting over there by herself at a table. Have you ever wondered what an elderly lady's doing sitting at a table by herself? You know, maybe she used to come in there, you know, with family, and maybe her husband just went to be with the Lord. Maybe her children live in Oklahoma. Maybe she's got nobody else. So she decides she'd want to go and have a meal. Do you know what it means when you get up out of your seat and you walk over there and say, Hey, you just suddenly sit down and say, hey, I'm, I'm Don, you know. How are you? Now here's a real kicker, because this is going to ruin your whole meal. You, you, sometimes you can even say, listen, man, why don't you come and pull up at you? We've got a spare chair. Come sit at our table. And if they feel they want their solitude, still ask them. Now, I'm not saying that's the more. You don't have to do that. Right? I'm telling you, you make that lady's day like you. That's compassion. Any questions here today? What do you suppose Paul was saying? What is he trying to say to us here? I mean, it just goes off. He says he was compassionate. He was strengthened through trials in verse 19. He said, despite all these trials, I'm still doing it. Number seven, he was determined despite the opposition. He says, even though I had these people 
coming after me all the time, I did not shrink. You know what the word shrink means? Watch me. Someone came and told me they don't like me because I'm talking about Jesus. I did not shrink. He was determined despite the opposition. How about the next one? This part of his testimony. <laughs> he was public in his teaching. The word says there he went publicly from house to house. By the way, what does shrinking produce? Private. The end result is I'm going to keep this in here. Okay, let me just clarify something here. Because this is a good point. Your salvation is totally private. Did you know that? Because only God can save you. You have to do business with Jesus. I can't do it for you. Pope can't do it for you. Your best friend cannot do it for you. Your salvation is totally private. But your Christianity is 100% public. The outworking of your salvation. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, let your light so shine before others, before people, that they will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's what Paul's talking about. He said, the testimony of my life is my personal encounter with Jesus manifested in public. Our big challenge is to be as much who we are in here as who we are out there. He was also, ninth thing here, he was impartial in his witness. You know, you know what he tells us right here in this passage in verse 21? He says, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks. He was impartial. Now what does impartiality mean in a testimony? It means that nothing about you is governed by who you speak to, or who you meet, or who you love, or who you have compassion on. It matters not. Paul loved all people because Jesus does. The message stays the same, and the love stays the same. There is no difference. Do you know when Jesus died on the cross... He took the color out of our eyes. When you give your life to Christ, He takes that prejudice, that hate, that disposition. For all people in every circumstance out of you, you lay it at the foot of the cross and you present the cross because Christ, when you present Christ in love, Christ makes the difference. He's the one. His word is absolute. And so there's a final point here. In this powerful testimony, he was truthful in his message. Right there in that, in that final verse, in verse 21, he said, Listen, I have not only been consistent from house to house in public, I've been impartial, telling everybody the same truth about the same God through Jesus Christ, but the content of that message is testifying repentance toward God and faith in Jesus. Why? Because he knew Jesus was the only one who can make us brand new. So last Monday was Labor Day, right? And Karen and I found ourselves in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where four of our grandchildren live. 
And so we were there on Labor Day. Had a great time with them. So we're going here, there, and everywhere, trying to do a whole lot of stuff in one day. And we end up back at Rob's house, and we're going to have a barbecue sitting out on his back lawn there. And my oldest grandson, he's 11 years old. His name is Bolt. Bolt comes up to me, and he says to me, Chief, he said, can I interview you? I said, interview me, Bolt? Yes, chief, I have to do this for an assignment at school, like tomorrow. (laughs) So I said, well, Bolt, of course you can interview your grandpa, you know? So he sits there, and I sit here, and we've got the smell of good food going on. And I look over, and I said, Bolt, are there 22 questions? He said, yes, chief. I mean, that's more than my average sermon right there. And I know that takes an hour at least to get through. So he starts. I mean, you want to hear these questions. You mothers are just going to smile at me. He's 11 years old for crying in a bucket. I mean, the first question was, can you tell us about some of the people who have had an influence on your life and why they've had an influence and what it means to you? I mean, that, what? That's going to take me 10 years to answer that question. And he's got about a space that big to write it in. (laughs) Well, one of the questions right up front was, where did you go to school? Oh, now I've got to try and explain to him that I actually came from Africa. Now, how do you do this to enlive? Any rate, so I said to him, well, Bolt, you know, chief went to boarding school in Africa. His eyes get big. He said, okay, chief. And he writes down B-O-A, no, B-O-R-D-I-N-G, boarding school. I looked over there, and he starts writing boarding school. I said, Bolt, hold on a second, buddy. I said, that's not how you spell boarding. I mean, like he should know this. He said, well, how do you spell it, chief? I said, it's B-O-A-R-D-I-N-G. He said, oh, no problem, chief. He picks up an eraser, and he erases the incorrect spelling, B-O-R. And he says, now, can you spell that for me, chief? B-O-A-R-D. And he's writing it down. I said, Bolt, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. What, chief? I said, Bolt, what is an eraser? He said, well, this is it, chief. I said, what does it do? He said, it erases stuff. I said, how much? He said, it just takes it away. I said, well, Bolt, You wrote the wrong spelling. And then you said you were going to pick up your eraser and you were going to use it. Now, what does an eraser do? It takes away what you don't want to be there. Right? He said, yes. I said, well, Bolt, look what happened. First of all, you didn't erase that completely, the incorrect spelling. Then you took the correct spelling and started to write the proper correct spelling on top of what still was there, the incorrect spelling, so that in the final picture, even with the correct spelling, you couldn't see what the word was because the bad stuff completely mixed up with the good stuff and you couldn't make sense of it. I said, what are you going to do, Bolt? He said, oh, chief, I'm going to erase this completely. So he got out his eraser, and he erased, and he erased, it's about the page of the thing, and he erased, and erased, and get all the fluffy stuff off, and he erased it, and there was not a single thing there, and he said, now how do you spell the correct way again? B-O-A-R-D-I-N-G. Bolt, can you see the word there? Yes, chief. Is it spelt right? Yes, chief. Do your teacher, you think she's going to like that you've spelt that word? Yes, chief. I said, Bolt, you know, that's just like Jesus. I said, all of us 
The Bible calls it sin. And all our lives are about incorrect spelling. And when you give your heart to Jesus, He gave His blood. And it's like His life is our eraser. And do you know that when you give your heart to Jesus, Jesus takes His blood and He erases all the incorrect and the bad and the wrong and the sin. But He doesn't leave anything there. He just erases it like erases are meant to erase. And it's just completely clean. And then He takes the correct, the right, the way it should be, and He writes it down. And when you look at it, and when you see it, it's absolutely proper, and it's right, and it's the way God wants it to be. That's what God does for us. And that's what Paul was saying to these people. This was the absolute limit, the height of his powerful testimony. I want you to know that I've told everybody that I've met that the only way to live is repentance toward God. Put your faith in Jesus because he makes you brand new. The band is going to come and join me here. And I'm asking you again and again and again and again and a thousand times over again. Have you given your heart to Jesus? Do you know him? Why don't you do that today? Trust him today. Next time you're in your office, someone walks in. What's God going to put in your heart? Wherever you are, sitting at a meal, cheering on your favorite team, sitting in a stadium, being a member of the band, the cheerleading squad, being in discipleship, what is it? You know, we know there's a great chasm that lays between us. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, my life was just written inside out with the incorrect spelling. I gave my life to Christ, and He took His big eraser, <laughs> and He just wiped the slate clean. And I, I don't know, but I think it's been like a whole lifetime so far of him just filling in the proper way to spell it at every turn, every step of my life. He adds another word, the way it should be, another disposition, another attitude that should be his. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So how about it? Upstairs, downstairs, Genesis, how about it? Why are we here? What's going on? What's God saying? I'm telling you, these are great days, man. I invite you today to leave your seat and come. Take us by the hand. Give your life to Christ. Let us celebrate with you. Become part of a church like this where we strive to serve Jesus. That's what we're interested in. Put your roots down. Take action. Become a verb. Take it beyond the adjective of your life. Don't be described, simply described as. Be as. Let it be the definition of your walk, not just the determination of your talk. God will do it, man. Let's stand together. You come as we begin to sing today. That lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through
through the darkness, your loving kindness, tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my Lord. tell you that song is just uh, that's so powerful Jesus Christ my living hope guys let it go man just let it go don't hold on let it go when you let go of yourself God takes it up and he puts it all into your heart and he turns you translates you something incredible and beautiful man and I just thank God for you today let's take a seat and take a first look let's see what's going on this week here's your first look at some of what's going on here at First Spartanburg our church-wide annual global impact celebration kicks off this coming week the 11th through the 15th there are many wonderful ways to get involved to enjoy music Food, and to hear incredible testimonies as we deepen our impact for the world for Jesus. Refer to the eBlast or online at fbs.org impact to see the detailed schedule for the week. Celebrate Recovery relaunches here at FBS on September 27th and volunteers are needed. We need greeters, leaders, servers, and help with the meals. If you are interested in investing in this life-changing ministry, go to fbs.org cr to learn more. Real Talk, a new men's Bible study, kicks off tomorrow night, September 9th, in the hangar, led by Seth Buckley. We hope you can join us for food and fellowship each Monday through November 18th. Plus, Finding Your Place in Ministry begins September 22nd and lasts six weeks. This unique study takes place on Sundays in room 132 at 9.30 a.m. Email khurry at fbs.org for more info. Don't forget all of our normal Sunday and Wednesday night activities are up and running for the fall semester. Check out our socials and website to see what's happening in each ministry. Until the next first look, let's keep looking for more ways to love God and love those He puts in our path this week. Wonderful, man. Wonderful. Matt, how about it, brother? Hey, church family. How are you doing today? Sweet. I want to introduce to you Chelsea. Chelsea, come here and join me for a second. This is Chelsea. She's from our area. She's coming today to join our church and to get plugged into the life and blood of our church. Let's give it up for Chelsea today. It's good to meet you. It's good to see you. I've got a few things I need to tell you. There's a guy that we all know and that we all love greatly. He and his wife, Jay and Chelsea Arrington, have had a son. And his <laughs> name is, let me make sure I get it right, it is Griffith James. And so they are celebrating that today, and we're going to celebrate with them as well. Absolutely. So that's awesome. Awesome. And so today, for those of you who are guests with us, and you're interested in finding out more about who we are as First Baptist, I want to challenge you to take a second, fill out our Connect card so we can reach out to you this upcoming week, so we can make some connections with you and get you plugged in to also into the life and blood of our church here as well. So if you're interested in doing that, I would greatly appreciate that. You could place it in the offering plates in the bags at the doors as we leave in just a second. Other than that, I'm oh, going to pray for can, our offering. Can I just, I just want to say one more thing about the missions thing coming up this Absolutely. week. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just telling you this because we all know it. This is our week. they all arriving this week. And, man, we've got all our student activities on, on Wednesday night, and so it goes on. 
I want to really encourage you guys. I just want to put in a word here. You know, you might find yourself, I know you're here on Sunday morning, you'll be here next Sunday, and other things, lots of things that you do. Just give yourself. On Saturday morning, we're going to serve through the bridge. Give an hour or two. And, and rock up there and say, you know what, here I am, I want to do something for the Lord. I promise you, it'll just... It'll make that ball game that you go to a watch even sweeter. It's just something about serving. And then next Sunday, Matt, at 5 o'clock, we're meeting here, in, right here in the sanctuary. Now watch me, guys. Put it down on your calendar. Next Sunday at 5 o'clock, just for an hour, come here. It will inspire you and motivate you like you don't know. We don't usually have a service on Sunday nights like that. We have a lot going on on our campus. But next Sunday night, you want to be a part of that. And you've got to actually determine to do it. You've got to discipline yourself. You say, you know what? I'm going to do this. And be here next Sunday night. And I'm just telling you, you'll be so inspired. And I'm an also, God is calling some of you out. He's calling you into missions, ministry. Watch, watch what's happening, guys. Just do it, man. Thanks, Matt. And missions looks, it has so many different looks to us, so we don't really know what that is until you take that step so that we can walk with you and figure out where God is placing you and in that call in your lives. And so will you pray with me as we close out our service today? And don't forget, please make sure you drop your offering at the doors as we leave today as an act of sacrifice to Jesus Christ. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity that we can serve you in so many different ways. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity that your son Jesus Christ made that ultimate sacrifice for each and every one of us. Just like the pastor was teaching today, that it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from, he made that sacrifice. And so Father, as we make that sacrifice today, also by giving of our tithes and our offerings, Father, will you go beyond our minds and our finiteness and father let's go into the realm of the of the unknown where you are and father take us to a place of trust and faith lord that we have never seen before and lord we thank you for opportunities like this week with our missions conference and lord i pray that you will begin now to prick the hearts of those that are being called out both locally and internationally Lord, that as we step out this week, that we will serve you in each and every way that you have called us to. Lord, thank you again for today, and we ask these things in your name. Amen. You guys have a great day.